there's power in being aligned with what you do. The great P.T. Barnum said it best. Unless a man enters upon the vocation intended for him by nature and suited to his peculiar genius, he cannot succeed. Circus succeeds because everybody knows how to mind their business. We understand that you must commit yourself to your peculiar genius. And circus is not a B plan. It's not a backup plan. It's not the thing you go to uh, just in case this doesn't work out. It is what you are. What is your peculiar genius? When Jonathan Lee Iverson first shared P.T. Barnum's words, it really got me thinking. And for a man who has spent most of his adult life part of the circus, peculiar genius is something he knows a lot about. You see, Jonathan has a pretty cool job. Not only was he the first Black American ringmaster of the greatest show on earth, he was also the youngest. And that comes with a pretty big responsibility. So what started as a gig turned into years of learning and growing, and soon moving into a new space that opened his mind and heart to something new, and perhaps more peculiar? The Omnium Circus, the theater of the I'm possible, showcasing a community of diversity, inclusion, disability, and visibility. So on this very special two-part episode of Holistically Speaking, and in celebration of Circus Day on April 16th, Jonathan shares his story of life under the big top, the circus life, the power of propaganda, the wonder and possibilities, and what it takes to let go of fear and doubt to not only find your shine, but your childish enthusiasm as well. And as a special bonus for listeners... A chance to meet Jonathan and the cast of Omnium right under the big top in May. How cool is that? Okay, it is time to take your seat and enjoy the show. Hello, Jonathan. Big voice under the big top. (laughs) Hi, how are you? I'm doing very well. It is such a pleasure. It is an honor, actually, to have you here on Holistically Speaking. And this is a first for me. Uh, I We're going to the circus today. So I'm excited to just have you here to share your story, to share more about Omnium and the work that you're doing and just really the just the amazing things that are happening to strengthen diversity, to let people know that anything is possible and I'm possible. And it's all possible right here. So thanks. No, thank you for having me. I hope this isn't your first time being affiliated with the circus. I hope you enjoyed the circus as a child. If not, your parents suck. I mean, you really need <laughs> to make sure. And and I really, I stand on that with my full chest out. Um, mm-hmm. Every parent that doesn't take their child to the circus, you're, you're missing out on the most wondrous form of entertainment there is, I think, because it's the stuff of miracles. It's pure entertainment, and it's high-level entertainment. It's playtime. It's professional playtime. That's what circus is. It's professional playtime at its highest level, and it has all the thrills and chills and danger and daring and humor and, and, and bad food that you could possibly uh, imagine. It's every, It's really like I always think of the circus as a, as a child's most extraordinary and extravagant dream, you know? Mm. Um, it, it's the safest place, I think, for the human imagination to be. Um, and it's the most welcoming uh, place I've ever uh, ventured into, honestly. And, um, it, you know, I remember a report actually noted that after so many years of being there, uh, when we were closing Ringling Brothers, it was a reporter in Charlotte, and I'll never forget, he said, you know, and he made a point of saying it, he said, I've I've seen everything, and I've never seen such a densely diverse audience. Like, And it's true. I've always said that my whole career. Everybody loves the circus. It's the place of, it's the theater of the impossible, you know? It's the science of miracles, and everybody loves miracles. Mm-hmm. They love to, I mean, it's not a hard sell, right? <laughs> People fly, not at all. fly, do daring things, and talk to animals. It's not a hard thing, you know? It's, 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 just, it's just pure entertainment. There's nothing magical. better. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's magical. 
And to answer your question, I have been to the circus. I have Good. such beautiful memories growing up in New York and my parents taking me to Ringling Brothers. And then I, I had my first Cirque du Soleil experience as an adult. And that wow. is, you know, that and, and sitting there, my first Cirque was actually seeing love, the Beatles love uh, out <laughs> okay. in Vegas. And it, I was, it was mind blowing to me because I mean, as a child, everything's of wonder. We live in childish enthusiasm, but quite frankly, Jonathan, I don't want to ever lose that childish enthusiasm. Exactly. Right? So for me, seeing it as a child, seeing, seeing different versions of it as an adult is a feeling of wonder. And, and like you said, possibilities. Uh, and there's been a lot of changes within the circus too. And to see, what you're doing with Omnium and this being a circus that's really holding space for diversity and those who are both, um, you know, have different disabilities and, and just living their lives powerfully with strength is really quite beautiful and such a gift of giving. Yeah, absolutely. And to your parents, you're good folk. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will definitely pass Please that let word them on. You're wonderful. You took it to the circus. <laughs> Well, how about your parents? I mean, how did you find the wonder of the circus? I mean, you're not only somebody affiliated with the circus, you were part of Ringling Brothers for years until until they closed their doors or the big top came down and after 146 years. And, and you were also the first Black American ringmaster, which mm -hmm. right there is an accomplishment. But how did you fall into this work? Well, I mean, uh, the circus was a part of my life growing up in New York City, New York. It was just a part of my life. It wasn't something that, um, it's so crazy because it was something I could take for granted because it's just something you did. I went to Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. um, and the biggest events in my life in Madison Square Garden as a kid was WW, what was then WWF wrestling, where I saw the great Andre the Giant and nearly lost my mind. And of course, there's uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, which we would attend annually, or, you know, every two years, whenever it would come. Um, and I just always remember the bigness of it, you know, the just the, the bombast, I, there was nothing specifically that I could point to, I remember the smells. You know, I remember just the rush of cotton candy and popcorn and that other stuff from the animals. And it was all delightful, you know. It was just, you just had this giddy feeling when you were there. Um, you felt lifted. You felt included. Um, these people who were performing were all the same magical and otherworldly and yet like you. Um, so it, it was always a marvelous event and experience. For me, coming to the circus was pure happenstance. Uh, let's debunk the notion that people run away and join the circus. They don't. People are called into the circus. It's like Neo in the Matrix. It's the weirdest thing. Like the circus comes and finds you. And everybody I've ever talked to, it's the same story. It's like you're pulled into this life. And um, it's not something, I don't know anybody who ever has it on their dream board. <laughs> You know, how can you, you know, it's like being, it's like being beamed up to, to a spaceship or something. And you're going to be with all of these fascinating people who are seemingly very normal, like everyday people, but they do uncommon things. And what makes it most uh, dynamic is that they do it together. Like you can put all of these different types of human beings with specific and peculiar uh, abilities and talents into one space and everybody lives <laughs> and everybody's able to create this common magic, this common piece of joy to pedal to the rest of the world. I, I think there's nothing better. You just said something that really resonated with me that all of these people come into this specific and peculiar space and, and we exist. And to me, isn't that life? Isn't that just living? Like all of us with different qualities and and personalities and characters and talents, we're all living on this big blue marble. And yet this is just a smaller version of that, you know, under the microscope where you're living in this 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 space and sharing it and you're broadcasting it out for those to see. It's like the Truman Show in a way. You're witnessing everything under that big top. 
And it's what a beautiful way of putting it, because really that is just the world in general. And I just wish we could come out of every day in the world feeling like how we come out of the circus. Right. I mean, ideally, you want your world to run like that, right? Yeah. Um, I've always believed that I, I always hoped that a sociologist or whatever would study, a social scientist would study um, the circus and its culture and mm-hmm. how that's possible. How is it possible? Because it, it really is a microcosm of the world. I think the, the key ingredient is that we understand that we are interdependent on one another. And I think maybe most of all is no one's no one's in the circus as a backup plan. So you're literally working with people. And I'm not just talking about performers. We're talking about people on the crew, people who sell you cotton candy, people who promote the show and publicize the show. Everybody who's involved in a circus is exactly where they're supposed to be. There's, there, there's power in being aligned with what you do. The great P.T. Barnum said it best. Unless a man enters upon the vocation intended for him by nature and suited to his peculiar genius, he cannot succeed. Circus succeeds because everybody knows how to mind their business. They Not socially, because we're just as nosy and <laughs> as any, any people, but we understand that you must commit yourself to your peculiar genius. And circus is not a B plan. It's not a backup plan. It's not the thing you go to uh, just in case this doesn't work out. It is what you are. You it, like a high wire walker isn't playing that. That's who they are. You know, ringmaster is who he is. Um, a, an animal trainer. I mean, you're talking about some very peculiar people. They really are that. Like they have a bond with animals. And I'm talking about the really good ones. They have a bond with animals that's really, it's inspiring, it, it, it's humbling, it's a kind of commitment that you rarely find in anything, because they don't have days off. Everything, I mean, just imagine, everything you do revolves around a four-legged mammal, mm-hmm. everything. I, I've talked to trainers, this trainer, I'll never forget, he has so many kids with his wife, but in one time she was in the delivery room. And he got a call about one of his elephants. And she looked at him and said, you know what our family's like. You know what deal is in our family. Animals first get to work. It's like you understand. It's it's just what it is. And so there's a commitment that comes from a place that is very sacred and that's very unique to you. And the circus provides that sanctuary and that that spirit, that that place where you can express it. And not only can you express it, it becomes aligned and interconnected and important and informs the other um, abilities that are there as well, because they all come together to just create this dynamic form of joy. And, and the adventure of the circus, I guess, for, especially for the impresario or the producers, is you, you don't know until the audience sees it. You know, it's it's not a remake of anything. It's not, you don't know. You don't know how they're going to receive it. You just know you're putting something out there and you hope that um, it's received well. And usually it is. I mean, people just, they love a circus. And, I'm, we, you know, I, I was able to experience that feeling again recently at Capital One Hall in Washington, D.C., or in the Washington metropolitan area. It's actually McLean, Virginia. And I mean, I we were here we are with my circus, Omnium Circus. We ventured into Capital One Hall, fifteen hundred seat theater. And um, you know, in my back of my head I'm going, Man, I don't know if we'll be able to read well here. I are we do we really belong here, you know? Here you know, it, are they gonna take to it child, when I tell you, we <laughs> barely opened the curtain and the crowd went wild from beginning to end. From beginning to end, How standing in the ovation. World? I, 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 you're sitting there saying before you walk out, the the person that people probably identify with the most and see the most <laughs> from beginning to end at the circus, and you're telling me that you stood there with a moment of doubt. Oh yeah, yeah. That you were going to be well received. 
Yeah, I just I had my doubts, you know, um, because she, you know, and I hadn't been in a ring really for a while. Mm. And um, I wasn't thinking about myself, so to speak. You know, I'm thinking we think in company, Mm. you know, as circus people. And so I was going over in my head, you know, all of the highlights in our show. We'll get them with that. That's how I'm thinking. And literally when I walked out. I mean, I barely, I didn't even say anything. People just went, I said, this is wild. I know how Sinatra felt. <laughs> well, and look, like, I want to touch on that for a second, Jonathan, because this sounds like, I mean, you we all deal with our self-doubts, right? The inner bully yes. loves to step in and <laughs> does a, a number on us once in a while, right? That inner belief system, the BS as we call it. And thinking that's even the, those like yourself who have shared the space and and performed and shared your gift in front of Luciana Pavarotti, Stevie Wonder, <laughs> presidents of different nations. I mean, you read pretty about much that, huh? <laughs> everyone. Oh, I read. I, yeah, I do my research. But uh, you've been in front of so many like top name people sharing your gift and not just your gift, but the gift of your company and your community and your family. And to sit there right before or stand there right before you walk out with that moment of doubt, doesn't that just say something about how we go to that space if we allow ourselves to, and we can really kind of roll downhill if we allow it to continue, right? So how do you get out of it? Well, you know, um, the, the way I get out of it is just experience. You know, I've been on stages for almost 40 years of my life. And so um, it's the strangest thing. I don't I don't get nervous, you know, and even if we went out there and they booed, <laughs> I, nothing would have it wouldn't have damaged me. It's just I'm kind of in that space now, you know, and people ask me that all the time. You know, do you get nervous? I have no fear on a stage. It's not there. Um I've been doing it so long and, and, you know, you, it's just practice, 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 practice. You just do something uh, for quite a while. And before you know it, it just becomes, you know, a part of your life. And all of a sudden you have these um, tools that you didn't know you sharpened uh, that are in your toolbox that mm. you can just call on and uh, access uh, when those doubts come up. Um, and it's not even, you know, I, I think we make, we make big shadows out of our fears. Fear is a, a real tricky thing. Um, it's like fire. Uh, thus spake the great boxing uh, training legend Customato. Um, he said, it's like fire, you know, I mean, you have to manage it. You know, fear can be really good for you. You know, I mean, you see a, <laughs> You see a raging, loose uh, pit bull in the street. Well, fear can tell you, you know, I may need to take, be cautious about that. Run. <laughs> you <know>? Right. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but fear can also keep you very sharp. Mm. And I think I'm in that place, you know, where um, because of what I do, you know, I, I know how to manage that kind of fear where, oh, I have to be a little more aware, read the audience a different way. Oh, they may not take to this this way but you know um with what I, I what being a, a live entertainer uh, an entertainer who performs in front of live audiences we have that wonderful advantage of the immediate gratification so we sort of know immediately um we having done it as long as i have you can read the room instinctively. And so you just pick up on things and you use them. We were very fortunate because we had a gracious, receptive audience. And it could have been a, a multitude of factors as to why they reacted the way they acted. We, we've been in a pandemic for the last two years and folks are happy to be out and about. Um, it also ha may have to do with, you know, look, there goes this tall, dark and handsome guy in a gorgeous suit and a <laughs> lovely young lady next to him. And people love pretty people. And uh, I sing pretty, too. So that helps. But I mean, more importantly, you know, when I open my mouth as ringmaster, beautiful things occur. People start to fly. People talk to animals. Daring things start to happen. Miracles happen. And so knowing what it is that's going to be presented really 
honestly gives me confidence. I, I feel like a cheap version of a, a I, feel, I always felt like a, a cheap version of Don King. I'm like this, I feel like this promoter who knows, look, I, I've, I've got Mike Tyson coming to this ring. You know, I, I've got Sugar Ray Leonard coming to the ring. You're going to be dazzled. And um, it, that's the confidence I go in with. Oh, love that. Love how you explain that. Uh, and touching on the fact that you don't know how the audience, the audience is going to be receptive. What about those that might not be coming to the circus? I mean, there obviously is the other side of the fence. There are people who are in opposition and kind of against circus life. You know, they think back to the days of, of carnival and animals not being treated well. And, uh, you know, there, I'm sure that comes into play once in a while because there are people who the animal rights activists or circuses are not what we should be sharing. It's not the right kind of entertainment. And I mean, things have changed and I'm sure there are, there is entertainment that involves animals that is not, it is not humane, unfortunately, but how do you respond to that? It's it, there's really not much I can do other than invite them. You know, I've had those conversations with people and I used to be very zealous, you know, what are you talking about? Our animals great. And they are, I mean, literally our animals are better off than American children. Mm. In most circles, I mean, I hate to say that, but it's true. Um, That's a powerful you know, statement. Like, I, I, literally, their health care rivals the president. You don't have a physician following you everywhere. Mm. You don't have access to your physician coming out of nowhere. Like we literally had, when I was with Ringling Brothers, these animals had, there was a veterinarian on call in the local market, we had a veterinarian technician who travels with us. So that's 24 hour care. And we had Ringling Brothers own veterinarians that would just fly in just because. The average elephant on a Ringling Brothers show, I believe they spent minimum care was 65 grand a year. That's most that's more money than most teachers, civil servants make. And that was their minimal care. Their food was local, so it's an economic stimulus. But more importantly, the animal was stimulated. And the studies have been done on it. I mean, I always, I always invite people who claim they, I mean, because few people honestly want to know. You know, I think when you're invested in your belief and somebody comes and says, well, actually, the sky is blue. That's hard because, you know, now your ego's in that belief. And so you have to deal with how, 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 how much do you actually value the truth? There's actually been studies done on animals in the circus, and they weren't favorable for those who raise money telling you these tales of woe. Uh, look up the work of Marth, Marth, Dr. Martha Worthington of the UK. She was actually assigned... <laughs> by the equivalent of the ASPCA in the U UK. Um, and she was assigned to look into circus and it's working. She's an animal scientist and studied animals. Well, when she came back with her findings, it wasn't to their liking. What she found was, well, the animals are highly stimulated. There's nothing that you need to do. They're actually overregulated and keep the regulations you have. Um, yeah, like any industry, you have riffraffs and idiots I mean, we certainly know this with law enforcement, but nobody's saying shut down law enforcement. Mm. In fact, they say give them more funding. That's what our president said. Don't defund them. We need to fund them more. I don't know. But when it comes to circus, everybody's talking about, you know, off with their heads. And I'll tell you why that is. It's a class issue. Bottom line, they hide it and cover it up through old oh, circus. So, you know, before I kill something, right? I heard this former gangbanger say this, and it, it, it seared into my soul when he said it. He said, why do you think we run around saying nigger so much? Mm. He said, because it's hard for me to go up to you and say, give me your wallet, brother. Right? The Jews went through this in Germany. I mean, you know, listen, those Nazis, you know, contrary to popular opinion, they studied Jim Crow. So they saw what America did to people who look like me, and they studied it, and they were good students. They understood the power of propaganda. We know about the 1915 hit, Birth of a Nation. 
where we still look at black men the way that movie depicted us till this day. Back then, the president, Woodrow Wilson, one of the most racist presidents we've ever had, literally said it was like history being written with lightning. That, sh that movie was shown in the White House. And so that imagery of black males went out to the world. So what do you think people were thinking when we got lynched? Nothing. Because it, for, I have to dehumanize you. And desensitize. Right. Well, yeah. guess what? And women know this all too well. Right. If I call you a bitch and a hoe and if I treat you like you're you're you get behind me, woman, if you're beneath me, then, you know, I mean, there were the actual, servant right, the there were actual laws that allowed husbands to rape their wives. You, you know what I'm saying? I have to dehumanize you first. And so w regarding the circus, most circuses are family owned businesses. They're small businesses. They're not big behemoths like a Ringling Brothers or a Cirque du Soleil. Few are really thriving like that. And so they don't have the funding to fight back with these crazy allegations. And here's, here's the gag. Most of these allegations, when they hit the court of law, in fact, all of them, they're either laughed out of court or they flat out lose as the ASPCA and the Humane Society did when they came against Ringling Brothers for a 14-year court or ordeal. The judge in that federal judge, you can look it up, he said it was vexatious, groundless, and frivolous. And that's why in a RICO suit, we recouped $25 million from the ASPCA and the Humane Society of the United States. Look it up. It's not on your local news. Why? Because the narrative says circus is strange. They're, they're mean. They're, they're crazy with the animals. But reality says the opposite. And so when you have these organizations like the PETAs and the Humane Society, these organizations raise hundreds of millions of tax-free dollars annually. Mm. So put that against a carriage horse, uh, a city's carriage horse uh, industry, put that against a small mud show circus. They get pummeled and they don't get pummeled because these people are telling the truth. It's a lie, but they get, you know, these are court fees. You got to go through all this. stuff. you got to go get a lawyer. You got because somebody made up something and said you did something and you got to keep it. So not only are you trying to make a living here, you got to fight off somebody who just can say something. They're people, I mean, they're businesses that have been d demolished just yeah. on somebody's, it, it's disgusting. On someone's word, yeah. Right. But the problem is the media itself is culpable because it never tells the story. It never tells the full story. It just tells what will get nice clicks and views. It's, it's, sexier to hear that circus people are these wandering degenerates who do cruel things to animals. That's sexy. The reality is boring. The reality is that the animals actually live much longer than they do in the wild. The reality is that they actually are highly stimulated with the travel. The reality is their health is through the roof. The, the, you know, the reality is boring. You know, nobody wants to hear that. They, oh, those moves are unnatural. Somebody actually tried to make that argument with me. You know, they're not supposed to stand on their hind legs. And the question I ask, well, how do you think they mate? Or how do you think they reach the trees for the higher right. fruit? Or yeah. But there's also that disconnect. We don't yeah. have a we don't have a respect for nature anymore. And so Duh. we don't know, Nailed we don't it. realize, we don't yeah. realize that, you know, animal, you can't make an 8,000 pound creature <laughs> that's the second smartest land mammal. Just do, do what you want on fear and deprivation. I've seen elephants. They're beautiful creatures. They're beautiful and they're fierce too. They have personalities, you know, they get angry too. They, I've seen elephants get pissed off. It's not, it's, it's scary. And it had nothing to do with some human. They're having issues with each other. It's funny thing to see animals. Animals have these interesting personalities. Some are jerks. I've seen dogs that are a little trouble, they're talented, but they're little troublemakers. And I, I would watch and I said, this is so fascinating. There were other animals who were attention seekers. 
I remember one in particular, Kellyanne, who you could not walk. If she was in your facility, she's going to put her trunk in your face because Kellyanne was very social. That was her nature. Give me attention. I knew dogs that would bark until you, you had to say good morning. You had to acknowledge their presence. In many ways, they are like us. And mm-hmm. so it's it's a matter of, you know, I mean, it's a matter of education. I always welcome people to really just get educated about it, really just read the full uh, story. And and by the way, I make no excuses for the jerk offs who are out there who do heinous things to animals. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think we need to be harder, not just on circus, but really just even people who own dogs and cats and things of that nature. I think we need to have higher standards because a lot of these ish incidences are happening with people who really have no understanding and thus no respect for these, these, our fellow uh, earthlings. Yeah, I agree with you on so much of what you're sharing. Uh, and I, I've been challenged too. I, I, you know, doing the work that I do, I've had a, the joy of working in, uh, horse therapy, you know, equestrian mm-hmm. therapy with children on the spectrum, seeing how they thrive on the horses doing their therapy, seeing a child that was nonverbal in a 14-week period say their first audible sound because of the rhythm and the connection with the horse. And there are studies out there that connect us to species and seeing like how dolphins and humans relate and and humans and horses relate. So mm-hmm. there is such a, a we are on this under the big top of the bl- big blue marble together and we need to share space in a positive way. But you're right. And we see this all the time as someone who also works in the news business, the whole idea of it bleeds, it leads. That's going to be your top story. And the kicker is yeah. always your last, right? So the circus come into town is going to be the bottom of the barrel unless there's something in the middle that has meat and potatoes that's <laughs> right. really going to that's really going to get the uh the attention of the viewership. I get it. I get it, yeah. Jonathan, and I couldn't agree with you more. And going back to what you're saying, also, you know, being someone who is wearing the wearing the coat, I don't even know, or the big the big the tails. The top hat, the tails, <laughs> top hat and tails right, yes. and taking on the task of someone who the original showman. P.T. Barnum, you know, mm. who I believe, didn't he even live in the area of like New York and Connecticut? And I think he I re- was everywhere. Somers. I remember there were signs all over Somers, New York, where I grew up that, uh, you know, he had he had a lot of uh, he had he had presence here in the New York area for, oh, yeah. for certain. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's Bridgeport, Connecticut. There's something there Bridgeport, as well. He was the mayor. That's right. And there's yeah. a museum there as well. The Barnum yes, Museum. Yes. Beautiful museum. Yeah. And they're raising funds to um, keep it, uh, to renovate it. So I hope and that's a tough are, town. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough town Barnum to get museum. anything. You know, yeah. they're already a food desert as well. So I did a story mm. on them years ago and it's, it's a tough town. So having even the, the balance of that environment and that kind of a city balancing with something like a historical, just a look back on what what the circus is all about is is really interesting to see that 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 um, balance there. But just with with yourself, I mean, how does someone like Jonathan Lee Iverson fall into wearing the tails and the big big hat? And I want to touch on that in a second. But first, <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everyone that's listening to Holistically Speaking. I am so elated to have Jonathan here. He is the first Black American ringmaster. He is with the Omnia Circus. And we're going to talk about that in a second a little more. And just the idea of inclusivity, diversity, being able to witness and be present at a circus. And this wouldn't be possible without my friends over at Squadcast that make this recording possible. And all of you who tune in all the time to Holistically Speaking. If this conversation touch, moves, and inspires you in any way, consider sharing it with one more person, pass it along, and subscribe for future podcasts just like this. So Jonathan, on that note, uh, tell me more about how did you fall into this family? I, I was in the right place at the right time. That's the short story. I was, I had just graduated uh, from the Hart School of Music of the University of Hartford. Hartford. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was well on my way to really continuing my studies in opera. And uh, it was Didn't so know crazy. That. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, that was my path. I was set mm. to do that. Um since I was uh, since I was like 13, mm. um, I was with the Boys Choir of Harlem, a very uh, notable 
choir, as you researched, and my life literally shifted into this interesting focus when I caught wind of the the legendary lion of the opera, Placido Domingo. Mm -hmm. And I can't even begin to describe what that feeling was like. Like every cell in my body lit up and everything went dark when he came out to sing. We were in Japan. We were on the same bill. And an older gentleman, came, he said, listen, I want you to hear what a real tender sounds like. And boy, whoo, he did not disappoint. And from then on, I was 13 years old and I was this quirky uh, young kid from Central Park West, up West Side. I'm going to be an opera singer. And what was so funny, what was so amazing is I, I had nothing but support. Even for my friends, because, you know, I was the butt of everybody's joke because, I mean, I'm this tall kid, so I'm supposed to play ball. You know, I was I, I broke that stereotype and then some I was absolutely atrocious on a basketball court. But what was funny is my friends got to see that I was having success with what I was pursuing when I was with the boys choir because I was always traveling. I was going to all these exciting places. They catch me on TV. So they were protective of my dream too. Mm -hmm. And I Beautiful. got to the Hart School of Music um, after graduating LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts. My favorite, just probably the best time in my life being there. And uh, I studied with the great Jerome Pruitt, the late great Jerome Pruitt. And you know, graduated. The idea was I was going to go to Europe. I didn't really want to go to graduate school, but I found this awesome teacher and we were going to set up in Europe. So I needed to raise funds, went out an audition for whatever I could. And during an audition for uh, the Fireside Dinner Theater, uh, which is out in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, the audition was in New York um, at NOLA Studios. I ran smack into the director, Philip William McKinley who unbeknownst to me was also directing Ringling Brothers at the time and was on the hunt for a singing ringmaster. That's what he said specifically when I got a call from Feld Entertainment after my audition for, uh, you know, um, the dinner theater. And I always tell aspiring artists, listen, in every audition, go out and give your best. In every audition, where most of the time there's going to be a no, Nine times out of 10, it has nothing to do with your talent. It's just, you know, casting is its own science. You know, I've had casting directors and producers literally stop me mid-song. I love your voice. You would be so perfect, but you're so doggone tall. You're too tall for the role, you know, or, you know, whatever it may be. And I get that. It, it makes sense. They have a job to do. And they're for you. They would, look, if you come in and you're, you fit, shoot, you make their job easier. But, I say that all the time. I say yeah. that all the time. It's like they want you to do well. They yeah. want to. They want the casting call to end, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So that they can be like, okay, we're done. We found our guy, our gal, right? right? I get the it. Best yeah. thing in the world is when you do so well that they go, you don't fit here, but I'm going to keep you in the back of my mind. Mm. And that's happened to me a number of times. But most importantly, it happened to me during this audition for the fireside. I mean, literally that night I got a call, said, yeah, we want you for the dinner theater. Um, we, we, congratulations. We want you for that. But would you consider auditioning as ring for ringmaster of Ringling Brothers? And I, you know, I'm 22 at the time and a few thoughts went through my head. Is this a prank? Is this a CIA? Um, and then I thought ringmaster, boy, that's going to be a beautiful pickup line for somebody. So I, I was okay. Yeah, sure. And as I got to learn about what this was, that this was a long contract, I mean, at least a year, which is a dream for any performing artist. I thought, oh, that's great. I can raise some money. And this is what you'll hear from everybody who's ever called it a circus, right? Especially those who are on a, on another path, right? They'll tell you, oh, I was going to do it for a year or two. And then like 18, 20 years later, it's the best thing I ever did in my life. And that's exactly what happened to me. I was actually up against 30 other candidates for that job. And uh, but it was so funny because the director kind of kept letting on that he really wanted me at this spot. He didn't say it out because you can't. But I mean, there were certain things he would do, certain hints he would give. And um, I auditioned about two or three times. I auditioned for him. Well, I auditioned for him twice. They 
recorded the audition for Kenneth Fell, the producer of Feld Entertainment, whose parent company. And um, then I auditioned for the late, great Tim Holst, who had literally the greatest freaking gig in show business. This guy's <laughs> job was to scour the earth year round for, for circus talent. Huh. Like there, there, we had a joke at his memorial. There, there was a famous joke we used to, when he was alive, that there was this, I think it was like some shepherd somewhere in some far off country that nobody could pronounce who was being interviewed on like a program. And he pulls out a card and it's Tim's card. Oh <laughs> so this was his job. He went all over. So I auditioned for him. Wow. And he was a former ringmaster as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, after auditioning for him, I was offered the job and the rest was history. And I also found out it was like I hit a triple, you know, not only becoming the first black American, but I was the youngest and the first New Yorker. So this was so wild to me, you know, I mean, I just graduated college. I, you know, I endured my beautiful father who was an immigrant from, you know, Trinidad, Tobago. And like most immigrants, singing is not work. You know, you go get something practical. You go get something, you know, that's going to make you a living. You know, singing is not work. He's, he was supportive in his own way. He wasn't trying to veer me off, but he wasn't that encouraging. It didn't matter because I already had the confidence that I had thanks to my mother, thanks to the Boys Choir of Harlem, thanks to just my own youthful stubbornness. I was like, this is what I am and this is what I'm doing. And I had no idea it would veer me into such a spectacular life. You know, I couldn't have written it better. And it, it, and it was spectacular being with Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey. Really, the, I mean, I, I'll call it the second greatest uh, gig in entertainment uh, after Tim Holtz's. <laughs> yeah. So if you were given the opportunity to start doing that work of what Tim Holtz's work, and they said, it's, and you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to retire from doing the uh, wearing the tails would you consider a job like that? Oh at my that God, point? are you kidding me? <laughs> that, that was the plan. So that was the plan because I was going to stay single forever in a day. You know, I had this plan. Yeah, how'd that work for you? <laughs> no, it didn't work at all because this leggy, gorgeous Brazilian woman came to the show um, as our first batch of dancers from Brazil. And she happened to be the dance captain and the, and the translator. And she was a stunner. And I was told... Uh, by a mutual friend of ours. He was from Brazil and he said, oh man, he said, yeah. So this girl I know, she's coming. She's going to love you, man. She's going to love you. That's what he told me. And uh, I didn't, you know, I was, you know, I was in that stage that most, most of us go through. We all have that kind of, you know, that do, 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 do. I was like, where's disco? That's where <laughs> like I was. Like at the Roxy. <laughs> right. Yeah. That was at the, I was in my Roxy stage, you know, and I was like, yeah, whatever, man. By literally when she came she came in the fall of November 2000. And by the fall of two, November 2001, we were married. Wow. Yeah. That's an incredible story. So you both are living the life yeah. in the circus. So that's beautiful because you can support each other. Yes. Uh, lovely. I love that. That's a beautiful love story. That sounds like a movie, Jonathan. Probably will be I one mean, day. If she doesn't yeah. kill me first, then <laughs> then I'll be on one of those criminal shows. She loves watching those, mur those murky murder shows. I don't know. And I keep there's like a culture of wives. They love watching these shows. It's so oh, funny. Oh yeah, and that's a really big like crime is like a huge <laughs> podcast theme too. Yeah. People love other people's misery. It's really I have engaging. to say though, I get like that too. Like I used to love to watch when I watched more TV. I don't watch as much as as I used to. I think, but the the shows that like the first forty eight or solving right. a problem, <laughs> things like that. And you're like, oh, I've got all the skills I need to solve this this riddle, you know. <laughs> And I'm writing notes. I'm like, I got this before they even knew. I knew before the detectives knew. You know, I would love to do voiceover for those shows, man. They, they, You'd be great whoever, for that. Oh man, whoever does the voiceovers, those are gods to me, man. I just love it. They're amazing. Who's your number one favorite voiceover artist? Oh my I mean, goodness, of course it's James Earl Jones. Okay, I knew you were going to say I that. Mean, like, I nailed that. You know, James yeah. Earl Jones is the Lord, man. Oh my gosh, he made me want to read the nine X Yellow Pages when I was right. a kid all the time. I Remember used to, that? Oh, man. I used to watch him. I used to play him for my son mm. when he was in my wife's womb because uh, he would read, you know, there's a recording of him reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
I'm like, goodness, man. I said, oh, we used to put the headphones on. And I used to listen. I'd go to sleep with it. His, his he voice does have is, a good voice. Goodness. And to think he was a stutterer at one mm-hmm. time. That what happens a, what a lot. It, yeah. You yeah. hear those stories a lot. Yeah, he's a legend. Legendary. Absolutely. I, I, I have to agree. He's one of my favorites as well. So I I want to ask you a couple other things. Um, how, you know, we're coming out of this pandemic. We're mm-hmm. seeing the world opening up. And I'm curious, how did Jonathan spend his time at the last couple of years if it wasn't under the big, big top or traveling? Thank you for asking that. I spent my time um, pondering, wandering, creating, um, delving into businesses I had no business being in. <laughs> I went and got my insurance, life insurance license. And by the way, I will say that is it made sense that I would because – uh, that business literally exploded during the mm-hmm. pandemic because all of yeah. a sudden people start going, oh, GoFundMe is not insurance. I better get my life together. Um, I, I think uh, it's it's great stuff. I, I was working for a really well-established organization, um, and I'm still there, so to speak. I, I wanted it because it was flexible, and you know maybe I could find that very wealthy person that wants to buy a big policy, but um, the reality is, I uh, I think the biggest thing I learned, uh, biggest thing I gained from the pandemic is learning to, the lesson I always knew, stick to your peculiar genius. Mm. Stick to your peculiar genius. It's easy when life gets funky and throws you into different seasons that aren't ideal to forget about yourself, especially because you have bills to pay, you have a family to take care of, you have all that stuff. But if you're loyal to your peculiar genius, it will be loyal to you. And I have to remind myself of that all the time. And so it was such a wonderful thing when Omnium approached me. You know, um, initially I was approached about being on the board and of course, in circus, you never do one job. So eventually they asked for me to, to ringmaster. And of course, I, I, I said yes. Um, I love the idea of it. I loved what um, our founder, Lisa Lewis, was attempting to do, is attempting to do, and I think is accomplishing. And um, of course, it's a slow build, but it, it's a, it's a, a worthy cause. Um, I also got a bit creative. I created a, a, a little show of my own called Instant to Ring, where I was interviewing personalities from across the circus world. I also I, I came up with this interesting uh, read along idea, which I call Ringmaster Story Time. And uh, people took to it. It's so funny. So I'm going to keep in. I'm going to keep stretching that. Um, yeah, where I would actually do. read stories um, in my ringmaster costume, and uh, maybe I'd sing a song or two. But I, it, the big thing was reading stories um, for audiences via online, of course, because we couldn't go anywhere. And all I was thinking was, you know, a lot of parents are probably overwhelmed and may forget to read the kids a bedtime story, and so. I realized and people let me know, they were like, oh my goodness, you know, we look forward to that so much. And so I I started seeing it more as a service. So I want to do something with it. I want to broaden it Um, because literacy is still a major issue in this country. Mm -hmm. Like so many people struggle with literacy um, and they're ashamed, you know, and I would love to be a part of, you know, getting our culture to be a, a literate culture. And people not being ashamed, wherever, whatever stage of life, because there's multitude of reasons why someone may not have learned to read. Um, you have people young and old. It's it's amazing, you know. Um, reading is something is highly important in my family. I actually got my children to read really early. That wasn't to show them off, but my my one of my children in particular has a peanut allergy. So, <laughs> fortunately, this child, you know, was very taught themselves their uh, ABCs by two. And so I said, okay, let's play with the sounds. And we played with the sounds. And I remembered, oh, my mother put me on Hooked on Phonics when I was a kid. So I'll go get Hooked on Phonics, the program. And that's how I taught my child to read. And um, they took to it. And so about three and a half, they were reading basic words, you know how to spell their names, and those things. But the reason I did that is so when we would you know, go out. We were living in New York City. I knew I didn't want 
my child to like, just, I didn't know what kind of eater my child was yet. You know, some kids are snackers. I have one child who sh- this, this kid will eat your arm if you let them. Mm-hmm. And my other one, fortunately, the peanut analogy is <laughs> the one who is picky. And so we would go up to the newsstand and we would read a, all the candy bars and see what the ingredients was and things like that. And so that's why, but I, I think, um, you know, reading is just a, it's such a powerful tool. And I, I love to be a, about um, that resurgence of literacy and stirring the imagination and things like that and learning how to use our words. You know, everybody mm, speaks, in abbre- yeah, they speak in abbreviations. I don't even understand my kids anymore. <laughs> Everyone is, they speak in acronyms, like the yeah, LOLs. Right, and the, yeah. Well, because they're so used to having technology in their hand, you know, and <laughs> mo- removing ourselves from that, we get back into communication and connection. And I'm a college professor, and I teach on-camera presentation. I teach them to be mm. themselves, uh, you know, breaking the fourth wall and really having building that trust between them and the audience of one that they're they're connecting with but when you're doing this all the time you have your head in your phone or whatever screens we're looking at it really creates a disconnect so you're doing a service here jonathan so i'm going to put it out there to listeners who wants jonathan to continue with his his um ringmaster story story time ringmaster story time let us know share (laughs) with uh share with me and i will definitely pass that on to jonathan and maybe we'll even cut a few you know clips from it if people have things to say because we want you you to continue that no i want i want you to oh i love it you know you can visit my um my my youtube channel i have my youtube channel big top voice and so there are episodes there i think you'll enjoy it i did like a 12 day of christmas 12 days of ringmaster story time i did uh this past christmas season so it was a lot of fun Awesome. But I, I just feel like, you know, I want to be in that position where I use my talent as a gift, um, where I'm not worried about, oh, I'm going to get paid. But, you know, hey, I can use it as a gift. I can use it for some kind of good uh, that it enhances someone's life. And that, I think that's the ultimate purpose of it. It's our responsibility mm-hmm. to use our gifts and share our gifts. And I had somebody say something to me once when I was a little timid about sharing something that you know, a part of my talent and doing philanthropic and charity work, I think is really important. And it happens organically. Mm -hmm. If you're authentic, it happens organically. And somebody said, you can't not do that. It's a disservice to others if you don't share that. And I'm like, oh, that's different. Now it's not about me anymore. It's about (laughs) others. And it's a reminder that we are on this planet to share our gifts and be of service. You you, you, you know, can, you hit it right on. Like if my yeah. buddy T- Terry Weaver is is listening to this. He's probably saying, and it said, "Told you, Jonathan. He's been <laughs> on yourself. me for years. <laughs> you know, write a book. I, I've yeah. got to get out there because I've spoken at his event, the thing. He has a thing, the thing conference. He has every year, and um, he has all of these just extraordinary people and speakers and." You know, they come and they're, sh- they're sharing their knowledge mm. of their particular field. And um, I was honored to speak there um, uh, one year. And <laughs> he looks at me, like, you know, that look where like, I can't believe I can't believe you're not out. You're 50,000. You, you're easily a $50,000 a, a, a night speaker, man. You need to be out there. And, uh, you know, so I'm I think one of the hardest challenges for me, you know, um, you hear people, they talk about dealing with doubt and dealing with haters and dealing with people who uh, don't believe in them. But I say, you know, I think there's, I think it's even harder when you have people who believe in you, you know, yeah. and, and, and I have a lot of people who believe in me and somebody, I had one of, one of which she put something that hit me in the solar plexus. It was out in the general public. She put it as a meme, but she said, you know, somebody's waiting for you to do what God told you to do. And, you know, I think that's very true. Like we, we have but so much time on this earth. And again, it goes back to Barnum. Get to your peculiar genius. Get to your peculiar, you're here on assignment. Get to your peculiar genius. I mean, we think about greats like the late, great Kobe Bryant. I was thinking about this the other day, Kobe Bryant or Bruce Lee or Jimi Hendrix, right? And you think about people like that. It's interesting they all die tragically, right? But we never, we, we, we're we not focused on how they died anymore. They're more, ide- their ideas. Now they were young men when they went, but their ideas now, 
Like Jimi Hendrix is still the standard mm -hmm. for guitarists. Bruce Lee is still like this philosophical standard for martial arts. And now Kobe Bryant is like this idea of that, that whole mama mentality. Like he's an idea. He's literally an idea. His com complete commitment to what he was. There's something that tra it, it transcends everything. Like when you're so committed to what it is you are. And I've been fortunate enough to live in a time where I saw artists and athletes like that. I lived in a time when Michael Jackson was God and Michael Jordan was God. And, you know, for a while, Mike Tyson was the thing, you know, where you saw people who they were so excellent at what they did, but not only excellent, they were almost obsessive about it to the point where even if you're not into it, you have to pay attention and it bleeds over into other things. You know, what can you do in your, your specific with your peculiar genius where you're committed like that? And I think we all have that responsibility. I'm being a bit hypocritical because I got to kick myself every day and get up. But the truth is we, we have to, for the sake of our neighbor, commit to our peculiar genius because the world is round. The world really is a circus. I mean, the truth is that word comes from the Latin root for circle. And we are interdependent on one another. And it keeps going round and round. The show must go on. Well, if the show must go on, that means you have to, you, you need to get out there and say your lines. Mm. You need to get out there and do your part. You need to get out there and catch your cue. And you can only do that if you know what it is. If, you, if you're out here flubbing around, well, I'll try this, that, and the other, because quite frankly, it's just fear. Mm -hmm. It's fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to do the practical thing. I've known people who look, there's a wonderful saying, I think Bob Marley said it. There are people who, who, who are so poor, all they have is money. Oh, that's good. And, that is good. And, and it's true. I've yeah. literally counseled friends of mine who I know are financially, they'll blow me out the water and they mm -hmm. wish they were me. Yeah. They, I mean, everything in that, because it's so amazing when you're not aligned with what God told you to do. All these things can't be added unto you. They just can't. I've seen it. Friends, marriages fall apart. They, they got the money. They got the house. They can pay the rent. The kids go to great schools and they're popping pills. And they, they, why? Because it's so amazing when we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Our whole system. I'll, I'll, I'll reveal something to you. Speaking of trauma. I'll reveal this. And, it's, and this is not like a terrible, and I've had traumas before, but this was an interesting lesson for me. When I got my insurance license, my entire system, my entire being, everything in my body, everything, my spirit and my mind said, you have no business taking that job. Not only was it unfair to myself, it was unfair to that particular institution. Um, and it could be, could have been potentially unfair to people I was serving. Fortunately, I served them well enough. I had the good sense to always have experienced agents who actually loved what they were doing and were meant to do that, assisting me. But the reality is you have to stick to your peculiar genius Every and have the faith to know everything's going to work out, man. I mean, I, I listened to this marvelous interview with, with the with TV legend Steve Harvey the other day. And he told, he said he owed the government over twenty million dollars. His his so his he what happened to he taught I had no idea. This was after Kings of Comedy. Mm. So I thought he was on top of the world. He said no. He said he lost every he said in my he said in my lifetime I lost everything twice. He said, and the second time was around 2005. Everything fell apart. I was in the middle of a divorce. He said he was down to like $1,000 and change. Then he gets this call from his accountant who had just died, his accountant's assistant that found his, all the, the checks and things he thought he sent them to pay his taxes. That account, they've been stealing his money. And he didn't know it. He thought it was coming out. They were actually taking what was supposed to be paid to the government out to the to the dime. 
to the penny. And so he thought that's what it was. He ended up, he was in a position and it was so crazy. He said, yeah, he ended up having an older government, $20 million. It's a miracle. He said he didn't go to prison. Um, but he said he got to work and what did he do? He, he stepped on his jokes. He said, I went and booked everything, booked everything I could. And somehow, some way he came out of that. It's, it's miraculous really. But it, the point is there's something about being loyal to your peculiar genius, Mm. trust it, lean on it, feed it, perfect it, be obsessed with it. If you love that thing, it's going to love you back and it's going to love you back in the most unexpected ways. I did not ever in my life ever even have the thought of, oh, I'm going to be a ringmaster one day at the greatest show on earth. That never crossed my mind. I performed like I, I did. That's why people reacted to me the way they did. And they still do. It never crossed my mind. I didn't even know that was an, a career option. My mind was getting to the opera stages, of, uh, uh, to, to the Metropolitan Opera. I didn't know I was going to be playing Madison Square Garden. Isn't that something? You know Life I mean? is a falling into, Jonathan. I say it all the time. I yeah. tell my clients, I tell I tell my listeners, anytime I'm on the stage doing the speaking engagements too, life is a falling into. And if you are not open and receptive to the possibilities of what you don't even know exists, right? then how are you possibly even going to manifest it? Yeah. All Just you live to, your truth. There you go. Obey. Yeah. You know, go the way your blood beats, says yeah. James oh, Baldwin. And, you love quoting people. Yeah, you know, well, it, <laughs> you know, if, if it's good stuff, it yeah. makes me sound smart. But you know, <laughs> you go to where your blood beats, says yeah. James Baldwin. I mean, and, and you you go, and and it's funny because maybe you know that thing you're going for, or you think is your it, it may it may be just be leading you to somewhere. You know, right. I think about Martin Luther King, right? Mm-hmm. You know, by all intents and purposes, Martin Luther King was a, a, a he was a scholastic genius. People forget this. He was he skipped several grades in school. He was the school, he had his doctorate by about twenty six years old. This was a very smart man. By all intents and purposes, he came from a family and a lineage of preachers, and being a pastor in the black community definitely at that time was a prestigious middle class thing. He didn't come from poverty, just like his wife, especially um, Coretta Scott King who was then Coretta Scott, she came for more money than him. She was an accomplished singer and musician. You know, I mean, they came from <laughs> good stock. How could he know he would end up being this called to be this, what he, and I'm sure he was, look, that was a, a, an interesting life. You know, I love the speeches he make where you get to really look into his humanity because we love to lionize these people. And you hear him like break, almost break down. Look, I want to live long like everybody else. I'm tired of marching for something I should have had at birth. He said, I don't have a martyr's complex. I want to live like everybody else. I mean, to hear his humanity, he was only 39 with four beautiful children and a glorious wife. You want to live like everybody else, want dignity. And he could have easily just gone off and, and, and been a good Atlanta preacher mm-hmm. and, and, and lived pretty well in the, the, the economic class that he was in. Because not every black person was for him, especially those in business community. You know, that, yeah. that's, that's something that, we never. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't realize that everybody wasn't mm-hmm. for him. He was the most hated man in America at the point of his death. I mean, we, we have to understand that. You know, listen, I truly believe it. It's God who has made us and not we ourselves. You have a calling that may not be what you dreamed about, but you have this peculiar genius that kind of, you know, kind of, it's like a Pied Piper. It brings you along, brings you along and, oh, that's what I am. That's what I do. That's what I am. That's what I'm here to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that is really what we're supposed to be after. So it all starts with that obedience and everybody has it in them. Everybody, I don't believe people when say, I don't know. Usually it's, look, we usually find it when we're children, Mm -hmm. but some adults somewhere, usually our parents, because parents, I hate to say it, they can be wonderful, but parents can be the greatest dream killers ever. They're the most prolific dream killers. 
It's based on their own fears. Yeah. I want my child to be successful. I don't want them to struggle. I, what happens when I'm gone? Who's going to take care of them? And And it's your, I, I have that conversation with my mom all the time and she's very, very good about this from her own growth and whatnot. But those fears are not ours. They're theirs. It's ancestral trauma too. Isn't it funny? It's always coming for people who haven't even had success in the truest Mm -hmm. sense. They just don't want you to fail. And it's like, that's not your responsibility. Yeah. That well, is they, not your responsibility. Well, and, and worse off, not even if they not want you to fail, they don't want you to succeed. That's even worse. Like, mm. as you hear about that all the time. The great Alan Iverson, he was on a, a podcast recently talking about like people he thought when he was just Alan Iverson in Virginia the hot athlete, but these were my friends. They were with me. And when he said, and when that money came in, it's like, he's like, it's just crazy. I mean, I had a buddy of mine say, one of my best friends in the world is, is a, is a a wonderful bass player. And we actually became acquainted when we were both on the Ringling show. So he played in a live band that we had. He's an excellent musician. And he now plays for the Lion King tour um, uh, I believe they call it the Rafiki tour, but he plays for them now. But I remember him telling me his story. It was so inspiring because he's one of those people. And he was saying, I, you know, he said, man, I was dragging along in a corporate world and I knew I wanted to do music. That's what I wanted to do. He said, when I got the Ringling gig, <laughs> he said, you know how many friends I lost Mm-hmm. He said that was such a big awakening. And what he realized is, you know, sometimes your success will bring out in people something pretty vicious because your success is a reminder to them that they're not living up to their peculiar genius. They're not living up to what they're assigned to do. And maybe it's just on aligning with who they are. I mean, what is the quote? People come into our lives for a moment, a season, or a lifetime. I mean, yeah. every person's a lesson that walks into our space from the guy bagging the groceries that you have a conversation <laughs> with to right. the high, the high, the top folks. Every person has validity in our lives. And some of them that you think are going to be there for the entire life. Might not, but there's a lesson. And that goes like every relationship we have that doesn't work out and fails, every friendship that doesn't work out, there's some nugget of goodness in that time period they were with you. So where is the lesson you can take from it? And then you start vibing with your tribe, aligning the people you want in your life that lift you up, that are on your side. And the challenges are good too. Like we kind of need the haters and the people that don't mm-hmm. agree with us because Absolutely. that's what the life, that's what life's about, right? So uh, yeah, I'm thinking the about circle. relationships. The circle. It's a circle. <laughs> it's a circle. I love coming back to that. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. First of all, this is one of the most delightful conversations I've had on Holistically Speaking. We might even have to make it into two parts because sure. we're going over the hour line. So folks, hang with us. If this becomes a two-part episode, you'll know why and you'll want to stick around for part two. <laughs> And that is exactly what we're going to do here because there is just way too much to share on Holistically Speaking with Jonathan. So make sure you subscribe to the show so that you don't miss act two of this very special two-part episode with the ringmaster himself. But if you want to connect with Jonathan in the meantime and find out more about the big man under the big top, head on over to his website. I put that link on the podcast page. You will also find a link to the Omnium Circus there as well. And remember... If you purchase tickets to the show, let me see them. Just tag me, Jonathan, and the Omnium Circus in your social media post. Show me those tickets. You could find yourself hanging out with Jonathan and the cast on May 14th. That's a Saturday at the Queens Theater in New York City. That's where their show's happening. Maybe I'll even join you and we will make it a date. If you have additional questions about this episode, reach out to me and connect on social media at Hillary Russo or visit my website at hillaryrusso.com. If you're interested in more brain candy and the sweetest ways to be kind to your mind, I would love to have a chat with you. And if you're enjoying this episode, pass it along to someone you think would love to tune in or maybe even attend the circus in May. And as always, let me know how I'm doing over here. Leave a rating and review wherever your earbuds take you. Hit that subscribe button because you don't want to miss what we have coming for you next week with Jonathan and the circus. 
Holistically Speaking is edited by David Seiss with music by Lip Bone Redding and recorded on Squadcast. So go on out there, find your peculiar genius, and remember always, be kind to your mind, and don't forget to laugh. I know the girl with mountains in her eyes.